Okay, everybody, in this week, we're going to talk about the court system. You know, we're going to talk about the state court system, the federal court system. And as part of the federal court system, we obviously have the United States Supreme Court, which has a profound effect on our everyday life. Okay, so let's kind of take a look at, um, you know, we've kind of learned about Marbury versus Madison uh, earlier in the semester. And as we kind of remember, Marbury versus Madison evolved out of um, an appointment that was... Um, supposed to be given to uh, Mar uh to Marbury and he wasn't given it to it by by Secretary of State James Madison so the Supreme Court took it up and in this case they established the power of judicial review which is really really important so the Constitution is the supreme law of the land U.S laws and state laws must be congruent so remember kind of from federalism um, we can have a state law as long as it doesn't interfere with a constitutional right. And with that being said, we can also have a state law, but if a federal law exists counter to that, federal law is going to take precedent, and we've used kind of the cannabis law as a good example of that. Right? So Article 3 of the Constitution gives the Supreme Court to, in, the power to interpret the meaning of laws, and in case of conflict, they should decide what, what should prevail. Right? And the courts are sworn to uphold the Constitution, so it must declare void any law that conflicts with it. So, in a sense, federal the federal system, the Supreme Court, federal judicial review give uh, gives them to right to, to determine whether or not a law is constitutional or not. Um, federal judicial review also has uh, power over state law, and that evolves out of a case called Martin versus Hunter Lisi, and it gave the court the power to review decisions by state law. So we could see these two cases here. These two cases are very, very important. First of all, um, the Martin versus Hunter Lisi gave the court the power to review decisions by the state court, right? So they can review state law. Now remember, Marbury versus Madison gives them the power to 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 interpret federal law. Now we also have McCullough versus Maryland, which gives the states the right to exert independent checks. Um, so it de sorry it denied the states the rights to exert independent checks on federal authority. So it sets up your system of judicial nationalism right there, where the federal government can't really be touched by state decisions. So when we talk about the making of a Supreme Court justice, a lot of them come from upper middle class to upper class backgrounds. Um, the 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 um, with the exception of Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who grew up in modest uh, in a modest background, but for the most part, a lot of these justices have grown up in politically influential families, upper class families. But you know, we can look at the court now, and the court is going to be much diverse than it has been in the past. And more than two thirds of the justices who have served in all of the current court attended um, Ivy League schools or other prestigious law schools. I think um, Justice Amy uh, Comey Barrett actually went to Notre Dame, so uh, still a prestigious law school, but not technically an Ivy League. Um, we've kind of seen the process, you know, going all the way back to uh, you know, Robert Bork in the 80s and up to Clarence Thomas in the 90s. We've seen the case of this process become really, really politicized. And anytime we have a vacancy in the Supreme Court, it seems like both sides will dig their heels in and maybe call certain nominees out and say that they're not fit to um, serve. So, um, yeah, you know, and there's really no wiggle room out of this and it has become a really really partisan process so here is our current supreme court um the blues on the bottom the three uh, women are nominated by democratic presidents and the reds are the ones that were nominated by republican presidents um so if we can kind of infer um you know there might appear to be a 6-3 split here but at times gorsuch and john roberts have at times voted with the liberal side of the court so it, it's it appears that there is a sense of a pretty good majority in the court for republicans but in a sense you know sometimes roberts and gorsuch will fluctuate so you know if we look at the making of a supreme court judge and we look at kind of um 
recent nominees. Um, Obama, I was able to nominate Sonia Sotomayor and Aleta Kagan. Both were confirmed. Uh, Trump nominated and had Neil Gorsuch. Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett confirmed by a bipartisan, bipartisan Senate. And they use what's called the nuclear option, or the Republicans use what's called the nuclear option to, the, to get Gorsuch's nomination put through. What that means simply is that prior to 2016, you needed a 60 vote threshold to confirm a Supreme Court nominee. Now, when Justice Scalia passed away, so it left an opening on the Supreme Court. Obama wanted to nominate, you know, the current, current Attorney General Merrick Garland. But Mitch McConnell and the Senate Republican leaders wanted to hold off and wait until after the presidential election, which was a good probably couple of six months away. So um, it wasn't like it was the next day. Um, so Trump won. He was able to nominate Neil Gorsuch. McConnell knew that he wasn't going to be able to get the 60 votes in the Senate due to the Senate makeup. And in a sense, he had the threshold lower to 51 if it's a presidential nominee. So um, in order to invoke cloture during the uh, nomination of a Supreme Court justice, you only need a 51 uh, majority as opposed to a 60. So that's one reason that Trump was able to get his um, nominees through. You all know there's probably a lot of conjecture with, or a lot of anger with the nomination of Kavanaugh. Um, same thing with uh, Coney Barrett. So we kind of seen um, it work in the Republicans' favor. And then if you go the other way, uh, Biden was able to get uh, nominated and had Contingent Brown Jackson confirm. Uh, so it is a really interesting process and some of these questionings are of nominees are really really um, invasive I don't want to maybe not using the word invasive is proper but really uh, detailed oriented um, and it can get very contentious and um, sometimes nominees won't won't, won't um, comment directly they'll try to give vague answers As you all saw this week, the Senate is now considering a truly exceptional nominee for the United States Supreme Court, Judge Brett Kavanaugh. And he's doing really well. But do you believe the anger and the meanness on the other side? Sick. I welcome everyone to this confirmation hearing on the nomination of Mr. Judge Chairman Brett Kavanaugh. Mr. Chairman, to serve as Associate Justice. As the committee received just last night, less than 15 hours ago, 42,000 pages of documents that we have not had an opportunity to review. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I move Mr. to adjourn. Directly from Judge Kavanaugh. We have been denied real access to the documents we need. To advise Chairman, the regular Senate, orders called for. which turns this hearing into a charade and a mockery of our norms. Well, and Mr. Chairman. Be a hero and vote no. Be a hero and vote no. Judge Kavanaugh is one of the most distinguished judges. Mr. Chairman, I think we ought to have this, this loudmouth removed. So be on time, please. Not Gorsuch. You said Gorsuch. Yeah. Well. Judge, have you ever discussed Special Counsel Mueller or his investigation with anyone? Well, it's uh, in the news every day. I have you discussed it with anyone? Uh, with other judges, I know. Uh, Have you discussed Mueller or his investigation with anyone at Kasowitz, Benson, and Torres, the law firm founded by Mark Kasowitz, President Trump's personal lawyer? Uh, 
Be sure about your answer, sir. Um, well, I'm not remembering, but if you have something you want to... Are you, have you had any conversation about Robert Mueller or his investigation with anyone at that firm? Yes or no? Well, is there a person you're talking about? I'm asking you a very direct question, yes or no. Who'd you talk to? I don't think I, I I'm not remembering, but I'm, I'm happy to be refreshed or if you want to tell me who you're thinking so are of you, works. I, are you saying that with all that you remember? So remember, we have a federal court system as well as the state court system. Trial courts of the federal system have over 600 judges, and these judges are placed on the bench and are able to serve up for life, right? They hear criminal cases that are prosecuted by the U.S. Department of Justice as well as civil cases. Some criminal cases might be things like kidnapping and taking somebody across state lines, uh, the murdering of a federal official, um, some type of crime in a federal building, uh, maybe robbing a bank since money is protected by the federal, uh, the, um, the Fed, and um, maybe transporting drugs or people across the border. That's another thing that can um, cause you to end up in, in federal court. So, you know, they use grand juries and regular juries. We're really not going to get into depth about, you know, maybe the, the functionalities of the courts um, as far as trials. But, you know, grand juries and juries are there to either indict a person. A grand jury is used to bring out an indictment against a person. You know, basic citizens that come together and make decisions about whether or not to press charges against somebody or indict somebody. And juries, as we all know, are instances where, you know, you, you can have people maybe judge you in a case or you know listen to your case and make a decision about your your case either on the criminal side or the civil side remember criminal we all know what that is civil if you have a disagreement per the seventh amendment we can go and sue somebody the next level up above the federal in the federal court system above the district courts is the, is the circuit court of appeals um you can't just appeal a case because you lost you have to appeal a case on the basis that there was some type of violation of the constitution that was uh that happened in your case so they don't accept they don't hold trials or they don't accept new evidence they only consider whether or not the trial court in this case the district court uh was acting within the framework of the constitution right they have little discretion in hearing appeals, and nearly 100 circuit court judges throughout the country usually serve on three-judge panels, and most of our cases will, will end at this level. So you can see here, here is the federal court system. We have these courts that are considered to be the district courts, right? And there's 94 of them in our 50 states. You know, they hear criminal cases as well as civil cases. We also have bankruptcy court. Territorial court, uh, the federal courts of claims, this is where you'll sue if you have a, a grievance that qualifies to be heard in federal court. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, the FISA court um, and a bunch of you know tax courts as well. And at the next level is the U.S. Court of Appeals, and there's 12, and we'll look at these in a minute. And then we have the Supreme Court at the very top. And then keep an eye on this. We also have state courts on the left. We'll talk a little bit about state courts in a minute. So here are our United States Court of Appeals. As you could tell, it's divided up into uh, 12 districts, including the D.C. Circuit, Federal Circuit Court, and the Supreme Court. Um, so we have kind of geographical boundaries of appellate courts here in the United States. On the West Coast, here in California, we're a part of the Ninth Circuit. So if there is a, a federal uh, appeal that we have from the district court here in San Diego, we would elevate it to the Ninth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. So if we look at the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court is going to be the final interpreter of all matters regarding the U.S. Constitution, federal laws, as well as treaties. They have what's called discretionary review, meaning they're the ones that determine whether or not they want to hear a case. 
So there's something called the rule of four, right? So if four Supreme Court justices agree to hear a case, then it'll be reviewed. And we'll talk a little bit more about the processes in a minute. And the session for the court runs from October through June. All right, so, you know, you get July and August, September off. Federal court's jurisdictions extend to certain types of matters here. And when we use the word jurisdiction, try to maybe kind of interchange it with maybe responsibility. Federal court jurisdictions extend to cases that have, you know, where questions that exist about the Constitution, exist about federal laws or treaties, um, any type of case that might involve an ambassador, a public minister or counsel or things that might happen on the ocean or the seas. Where the U.S. government is a party, so if somebody's going to sue the U.S. government, then it'll be heard in federal court. Between two or more states, between a state and a citizen of another state, between citizens of different states, and between a state or a citizen and foreign government, a citizen of another nation. So you can see the jurisdiction is pretty wide in here, but it's also very specific to certain things that the federal court system is, is responsible for. You can directly appeal a case from a state Supreme Court to the United States Court, um, United States Supreme Court. Federal courts usually do not interfere with state court cases. Um, parties to cases in state courts must go through the entire state court system before federal court will hear their appeals. So, for instance, we'll talk about the kind of the the. The nuances of the state court system in a minute but if we go through the state court system and go up and not get any relief through there we can appeal a case directly to the supreme court without having to restart in federal court usually federal court caseloads are going to be less than state courts most of your cases are going to happen in the state court side but federal courts do, do have a lot of traffic in it right so when we, when we talk about it and talk about some of the things that come out of the prosecution of crimes um, federal crimes generally center on offenses that were committed against the u.s or its property we talked a little bit about that were committed against the u.s government official or employees while on duty something that may cross state lines you know interfering with interstate commerce is a violation of federal law and any type of crimes that might occur on federal territories or over on the seas. And like I said, Florida court judges hold their seats until they resign, die, or remove from office. This includes district court judges, appellate judges, and Supreme Court justices. So on the federal side, judges are on the bench for life. We've seen the structure of the federal court system. So now let's talk about the state court system. Uh, and state court systems are structured very similarly. Uh, but, but there are some differences. So, so let's see what they are. And, and as an example, I'll use the California state court system. Um, just, but just keep in mind that, that every state's court system is a little different. So if you want to know how a particular state's court system is structured, you may have to do some research uh, to see how the court system for that state might be similar or different. Now, like the federal court system, every state court system has a high court, a high court. And that court operates a lot like the United States Supreme Court does. Uh, it grants certiorari to review the decisions of lower courts. Now, it isn't always called the Supreme Court in every state, but in California, the high court does happen to be called the Supreme Court, the, the, the California Supreme Court. So that's what this box is, the California Supreme Court. And just like the federal court system, directly below the high court is an intermediate layer. An intermediate layer. Um, and in the federal court system, remember, we called the courts in this intermediate appellate layer the circuit courts, right? The circuit courts. But in the California court system, the state court system, we just call this intermediate layer the court of appeal. Court of Appeal. All right. Now, there are a few things to note about the Court of Appeal. First, remember that the circuit courts in the federal court system, uh, that they're officially called the United States Court of Appeals for the name of the circuit. Right. So, for example, the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. 
But in the California state court system, we don't call the intermediate appellate court the court of appeals. We call it the court of appeal with no S. Right? That's just something you want to keep in mind if you ever happen to be in the California Court of Appeal. If you're there and you say you're in the Court of Appeals, um, people are likely to think, aha, this is, this is amateur hour. <laughs> this person must not be from around here because he doesn't know that around here we call it the, the Court of Appeal, not the Court of Appeals. All right. So th um, th the second thing to note about the California Court of Appeal is that it uses some familiar terms, but it uses them differently. Uh, in the California state court system, the intermediate appellate layer is divided into what we call districts. The California Court of Appeal has districts. Uh, there are six districts in the California Court of Appeal. The first district, second, third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth. Right? Remember that in the federal court system, the appellate courts are divided into circuits. Right? Let's look back at our federal court map. Right? The intermediate appellate layer was divided into circuits, and each circuit um, had its own had its own court, and the circuit courts hear the appeals from the trial courts, which are called district courts. But in the California state court system, the appellate court is divided into districts. There are no circuits. They're divided into districts. And in each district of the California Court of Appeal, here's appeals from the trial courts of that district. So the term district is used differently by the federal court system and the California state court system. So be sure that you use the term correctly. So each district of the California Court of Appeal uh, is responsible for hearing the appeals from the trial courts in that district. Right, so we've got the different trial courts within each district. Um, and the trial courts in the California state court system are, are, are called something different. Obviously, they can't be called district courts. So in the California state court system, the trial courts are called the superior courts. The superior courts. Right, there's a separate superior court for each county. Each county has its own superior court. So if we look at a map of the state, let's come down here and take a look at a map of the state, we can see that uh, the state is divided into six districts, and they're, they're color-coded here on this map. Right? There's a, a different color for each of the districts. And, and each of the districts is divided into counties. That's what these little divisions are, and they're all labeled. Right? Now, each of these counties has its own superior court. And as I said, the superior court is the trial court of the California state court system. Right? So in the first district, we had counties that are colored blue, like uh, San Francisco, Marin, and Napa. In the second district, which is green on this map, let's see, we've got um, LA, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo. And then um, in the fifth district, the orange district, We've got counties like Fresno, Kings, and Kern counties. All right, so now let's go back up to our diagram and fill this in. So in the first district, we had the San Francisco Superior Court. We had the Marin Superior Court and Napa. And there, and there were several others. These are just a few examples. And remember in... The second district, we had L.A. County, so the L.A. Superior Court, Los Angeles County Superior Court. Uh, what else did we have? We had Santa Barbara. And we had uh, San Luis Obispo. I think there was one other one, Ventura County Superior Court. Um, and then in the fifth district, we had um, Fresno, Fresno Superior Court. And we had Kings County Superior Court and Kern. And there, and there were several others. There were several others. All right, so that's the way the structure works. We've got a separate, a separate Superior Court for each county, and there are several counties within each district of the Court of Appeal. All right, so the next thing to note about the California Court of Appeal is that it's technically one court. It's just one court. 
right? So in the federal court system, let's go back and look at our federal court diagram. In the federal court system, there was a separate circuit court, or I should say there is a separate circuit court for each circuit. Each circuit has its own court of appeals. So the second circuit has its own court and the ninth circuit has its own court. And, and these courts are separate jurisdictions, so they don't necessarily follow each other's decisions. But the California, the California Court of Appeal, the state court of appeal, California State of Appeal, Court of Appeal is just one big court. It's just one court. Now that's why I've drawn this box here as one big continuous and uh, connected whole, right? The districts of the California Court of Appeal are just parts of one unified court. Okay, so what, what does that mean? Well, in the federal court system, each circuit, each circuit has its own court and each court is a separate court. Right? Each circuit court is its own separate court. Uh, and the trial courts inside of each circuit are bound by the decisions of that circuit court. But, but the trial courts are not bound by the decisions of other circuit courts, right? Because they're not in that circuit. Okay? In the California state court system, we only have one court of appeal. Sure, it's divided into districts. Right? But technically, it's one unified court. So that means while appeals from San Francisco, appeals from the San Francisco Superior Court, may go to the first district of the California Court of Appeal, and appeals from Los Angeles may go to the second district of the California Court of Appeal, all of the Superior Courts are bound by all of the decisions of the California Court of Appeal. Right? If the fifth district Court of Appeal makes a ruling on a particular issue, the San Francisco Superior Court is technically bound by that ruling, even though it's in the first district. Okay? This is an important difference from the federal court system. Now, there's some kind of, you know, different schools of thought on how people should, in a sense, act as a Supreme Court justice. Should someone be a judicial activist should a court look for cases to rule on, or should justices project, uh, practice judicial restraint, meaning they wait for courses to come to them, right? And when we talk about the rules of the restraint, there's kind of some unwritten rules that uh, the Supreme Court will follow. They won't advise the president or Congress on constitutional questions. Um, they won't decide cases that are hypothetical. They won't focus on something that is outside of the scope of what the case is and they won't pass up a constitutional question if some other grounds exist upon which it may dispose of this case this might be something known as precedent which we'll talk about in a little bit they'll try to interpret the laws to give it a constitutional meaning all your remedies have to be exhausted in lower court and in state courts before the supreme court will accept review occasionally they can fast track but that doesn't happen that often um and they will only confine this decision to the particular section of the law that is specifically unconstitutional, right? Something called stare decisis. And stare decisis is, some, is uh, Latin for let the decision stand, right? It means that if the issue has already been decided in an earlier case, that the decision stands and has precedent. So hypothetically, even though I'm not quite sure this will happen, hypothetically... For those of you that might be concerned with women reproductive rights, um, Roe versus Wade establishes precedent for women reproductive women's reproductive rights. Now, at times, judi judicial activists might be willing to discard precedents and overlook that and make a decision that overrides. Uh, one thing that Im immediate com immediately comes to mind is uh, the case of Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy versus Ferguson was a civil rights. Like I said, there was a court case called Plessy versus Ferguson that determined that you could separate facilities, but they had to be equal. Um, that was overturned by the decision in Brown versus Board of Education, which found that all these facilities were inherently unequal. Therefore, it was unconstitutional. So there are precedent or incidents where precedents might be overridden. Now, there's also a couple of schools of thought with regards to 
uh, how the Supreme Court justices should look at Supreme Court cases. Should they use the concept of original intent, meaning that uh, takes the values of the founders as expressed in the text and applies them to current conditions. So in a sense, trying to apply the law as clearly as possible and as clearly as they are able to with regards to their interpretation of the Constitution, maybe following the Constitution word for word. Now, there's also kind of that, you know, wisdom type thought where you can kind of uh, analyze and look at the constitutionality of laws by maybe applying everyday needs or everyday kind of culture types type instances. We've also become very, very reliant on courts. You know, that's generally how we solve our problems here. Um, we take people to court. Uh, politicians seem to abandon their charge to govern when controversy will arise, leaving the courts uh, to decide constitutionalities. We have a lot of, of congestion in court. We have more than a million law lawyers practicing. Um, over 250,000 cases begin in federal court each year. About 10% go to trial. More than 50,000 cases are appealed. Um, the Supreme Court receives about 8,000 appeals each year, but they only take about 200 cases. And, you know, some of the questions that are raised, you know, come out of the fact that some people think that uh, the judicial elite is increasing their powers, that we have our court system overburdened, and at, t at times we have injustices, which we all see. There might be instances of plea bargaining, uh, plea bargaining is generally used both in federal court and state court. If you're charged with a crime, it might benefit you to plead guilty to a lesser crime, you know, avoid trial, avoid, uh, you know, the time and cost of trial. 90% of cases are plea bargain. So that's a really interesting thing to look at. And it's more likely to be made by someone who is accused who cannot maybe afford a good attorney and accepts a court appointed attorney who already has a large caseload. Go ahead and look over this. So some famous Supreme Court cases include Plessy versus Ferguson, which establishes that separate but equal doctrine. A Brown versus Board of Education, which eliminated Plessy and desegregated public schools. Griswold versus Connecticut, which will be discussed in another another lecture we have here, as long as as well as Roe versus Wade. Matt versus Ohio, Gideon versus Wainwright, and Miranda versus Arizona. We're going to talk about these in the civil rights portion of this class, and we'll talk a little bit more in detail about these. So when we look at the Supreme Court of the United States, they're going to be the final interpreter of all matters regarding the U.S. Constitution, federal laws, and treaties. Like I said before, they determine whether or not they're going to accept a case. If they accept a case, they... they order something called a writ of certiary. A writ is an order of a higher court to a lower court to send all documents that they have about that case to the higher court so they can review and make their decision. And there's something, like I said, called the rule of four. Four of the nine justices must vote to accept a case. And we talked about the session times. So if we want to appeal a, the ca a case to the Supreme Court, um, the petitioner has a certain amount of time to to write a brief not to exceed 50 pages, putting forth their legal case uh, concerning the issue on which the court granted review. After the petitioner has a brief, uh, the other party known as the respondent is given a certain amount of time to file a respondent brief, and this brief can't exceed 50 pages either. So just think about it. Um, you know, 50 pages might sound intimidating, 50 pages might sound a lot, but when you're dealing with a a complicated Supreme Court issue or a complicated constitution constitution issue, that fifty pages might go uh, might go pretty quick. If it is not involved in the case, the United States government, who could be represented by somebody called the Solicitor General, can file a brief on behalf of the government, showing the government's uh, take on that case. If a group or maybe an interest group or some demographic group is affected by this. Um, something called an amicus curiae can be uh, filed as well. This is Latin for friend of the court, meaning that if a group is affected by this, uh, they can uh, they can be asked to write a brief and they can provide their argument and recommendations on how the case should be decided. 
The Solicitor General usually argues cases in which the U.S. government is a party. During oral arguments, each side is going to have 30 minutes to present its case. Again, this might seem a little bit daunting, but remember, you know, you have to be accurate. You have to be brief. You have to use that 30 minutes well. The petitioner goes first, then the respondent. If the petitioner reserves time for rebuttal, the petitioner is always going to speak last. When we have oral arguments uh, concluded, the justices get together. Uh, the justices will vote. And if there's a non-unanimous decision, uh, generally you're going to have a dissenting opinion as well as a majority opinion. Majority opinion are going to be written by uh, the majority group who voted in the majority, simple to say, right? Um, so the most senior judge in the majority is, or the the highest ranking judge in some instances, because um, there also can be ranked uh, by, you know, the, the chief justice who is John Roberts currently. Uh, if he is in the majority, he will assign uh, a justice who votes within the majority to uh, pen the majority opinion. Um, if he, the chief justice is in the dissent, then whoever the most senior judge or senior justice in the majority will direct who to will we direct the justice to write the the majority opinion. So we could see that, and the most senior justice in the dissent can assign a dissenting justice to write the dissenting opinion. Now, there's also something called a concurring opinion, right? Um, if a justice agrees with the outcome of the case, but for a different rationale or a different maybe interpretation of the Constitution, they can write something called a concurring opinion. Any justice may write a separate dissenting opinion of their own as well. Um, sometimes these opinions can be very voluminous. They can be large in, in, in pages. Um, but sometimes they also you can get a really, really good understanding of what the court and the court system is trying to accomplish in their legal rationale. So we talked a little bit about the majority opinion, the concurring opinion, and the dissenting opinion. So you have those definitions right there. We talked about precedent, you know, that stare decisis. And now let's kind of look at the path to the Supreme Court. And I always think this is kind of interesting. We're going to use the case of Windsor, United States versus Windsor. And this is a case that looked at what was defined as a marriage um, and what the federal interpretation of marriage and spouse was to be and when we try to apply that to opposite sex unions. Uh, before we used to have a, 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 a law in, in the 90s called the Defense of Marriage Act. And what the Defense of Marriage Act did was it defined marriage to be a, a union between a man and a woman. Um, there are certain advantages to be married, and we'll look at that. Um, section 3, like I said, Section 3 of DOMA um, put forth this definition. Therefore, when uh, people sued, they were alleging that their constitutional rights were being violated uh, and that DOMA was unconstitutional under the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment. Edith Windsor and Thea Spire were a same-sex couple that were married in Toronto, Canada, but they lived in New York. In 2008, New York recognized their marriage following a court decision. Spire died in 2009, leaving her entire estate to Windsor. And you probably, you know, you're going to see how much her tax was in a minute. But I'll tell you right now, uh, Spire was an investor in IBM at its startup. So you can imagine that she probably had a pretty good bank account as a result of that. Uh, Windsor sought to claim the federal estate tax exemption for surviving spouses. Um, she was barred, for, barred from doing so because Section 3 of DOMA, which provided that the term spouse only applied to a marriage, uh, only applied to marriages between a man and a woman. So remember, at this time, the same sex marriage was not being recognized by the federal law. The IRS found that the exemptions did not apply to same sex marriage. They denied Windsor's claims and they compelled her to pay three hundred and sixty three thousand dollars in estate taxes. If they were an opposite sex married couple, she wouldn't have had to pay that $363,000 tax. 
Windsor filed in November of 2010, filed a lawsuit against the federal government in the District Court of New York, the Southern District Court of New York, alleging that there was deferential treatment compared to other situ similarly situated couples without juris justification. Uh, Barbara Jones, who is a federal court judge, ruled that Section 3 of DOMA was unconstitutional under the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment and ordered the federal government to issue the tax refund, including interest. Uh, it was elevated to the U.S. Second Circuit Court of Appeals in a 2-1 decision they agreed with Judge Jones. The Bipartisan Legal Advisory Group, who was in favor of DOMA, appealed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. And like we said, uh, they lost and then they asked the Supreme Court to review. The Supreme Court accepted the case and affirmed that the lower court's decision that violated uh, that DOMA violated the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. And if we look at some of the rationale of what the justices were kind of being guided on with regards to maybe some of the benefits that might exist out of being married, like, you know, you can pay less in taxes, um, you know, you have protections with bankruptcy, um, something that's also important might be something like an advanced directive or a do not resuscitate order. Um, so, you know, there was a really, really good case made that same-sex couples were not afforded the same rights as um, opposite-sex couples. So we went in that. Basically, in the dissenting opinion, Justice Antonin Scalia, who was a, one of the more conservative justices before he passed, uh, he basically felt that the Supreme Court did not have the jurisdiction to invalidate uh, democratically adopted legislation that were was passed. So we look at the path. You know, we have the federal district court. This is where it started. Then it was appealed to the second district court of appeals, and then eventually to. The We'll hear argument this morning in case 12307, United States versus Windsor, and we'll begin with the jurisdictional discussion. Ms. Jackson. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, there is no justiciable case before this Court. Petitioner, the United States, does not ask this Court to redress the injuries it asserts. The House of Representatives Bipartisan Legal Advisory Group, the BLAG, which does seek redress in the form of reversal, asserts no judicially cognizable injury. While it is natural to want to reach the merits of such a significant issue, as in reigns against Byrd, this natural urge must be put aside because, however important the constitutional question, Article III prevents its decision here and requires this Court to await another case another day to decide the question. In the district court, Ms. Windsor alleged classical Article III injury for which she sought redress. Other persons injured by DOMA's operation could likewise sue in a first instance court and if their challenge succeeds, obtain relief. But to exercise jurisdiction on this appeal, when the United States asked for the judgment below, fully agrees with it, and Who else is going to be aggrieved if she's not? Meaning another person who is, whose benefits are withheld, tax refund is withheld, is going to be in an identical situation to her. Who else could come in? Uh, Your Honor, uh, it is possible that in district courts where other taxpayers sue the United States on similar relief, that the district courts will rule, rule differently. At least one district court that I'm aware of in a case called Louis v. Holder ruled against, upheld DOMA, even though the government had switched its position at the, that time. In addition, the issue of DOMA's Excuse me. If, if there's no jurisdiction here, why was there jurisdiction uh, at the trial level? Your I mean, Honor, the government the, comes in and says, I agree. Uh, or if there was jurisdiction, why, why did the court ever have to get to the merits? If, if, if you have a, let's say, a lawsuit uh, on, a, on an indebtedness, and the alleged debtor comes in and says, yeah, I owe the money, but I'm just not going to pay it, which is the equivalent of the government saying, yeah, it's unconstitutional, but I'm going to enforce it anyway. What would happen in that, in that indebtedness suit is that the court would enter judgment. 
and say, if you agree that you owe it, by God, you should pay it. And there would be a judgment right there without any consideration of the merits, right? Why didn't that happen here? Your Honor, uh, the, the two questions that you asked me, why did the district court have jurisdiction, the first answer is that the party invoking the district court's jurisdiction was Ms. Windsor, who did have an injury. Mm-hmm. As to why the district court didn't enter judgment when the United States switched its position, uh, I — I imagine that the Court was, would have wanted to have um, development of that issue, which was achieved through the intervention of the BLAG in the trial court, so that the judgment of unconstitutionality and of refund would have had a robust hearing. Really, that's very did. peculiar. When, when, when both parties to the case agree on what the law is, what, the, j- just for fun, the district judge is, is, is going to have a hearing? Well, uh, Your Honor, the jurisdiction of the Court, it seems to me, is not affected by the length of the proceedings it undertook. In about jurisdiction Kentucky. now. I'm talking about why the District Court, without getting to the merits, should not have entered judgment uh, against the government. I am not sure I have a wonderful answer to that question, Justice Scalia, but I do think the case bears some similarities to Kentucky against Indiana, which was discussed by the parties, where Kentucky sued Indiana in this Court's original jurisdiction on a contract. The two states had a contract. Indiana agreed it was obligated to perform, but it wasn't performing. Uh, there, it was worried about a state court lawsuit. This Court exercised original jurisdiction to give Kentucky relief. And I think that's analogous to what the District Court did there. The issue before us today, I think, is an issue of appellate jurisdiction. And the U.S. is seeking to invoke the appellate jurisdiction of Article III courts, notwithstanding that it doesn't seek relief. It seeks affirmance. Well, the Solicitor General's standing argument is very abstract, uh, but — Here is one possible way of understanding it. Perhaps the Solicitor General will disavow it. But it would go like this. The President's position in this case is that he is going to continue to enforce DOMA, engage in conduct that he believes is unconstitutional, until this Court tells him to stop. The judgment of the Second Circuit told the executive branch to comply with the Equal Protection Clause immediately. The President disagrees with the temporal aspect of that. So the executive is aggrieved in the sense that the executive is ordered to do something prior to the point when the executive believes it should do that thing. Now, wouldn't that be sufficient to make uh, — to create injury in the executive and uh, render the executive aggrie- an aggrieved party? I think not, Your Honor. I think not because I don't see how that would be any different from any party saying, well, we really don't want to pay this judgment until we're sure all of the courts agree. And I think this Court's uh, — this Court doesn't have a lot of case law where a party seeks review to get affirmance. But in the Princeton University against Schmidt case, uh, there was a state court conviction. Uh, high state court overturns it. Uh, Princeton University seeks review because its regulations were at issue. New Jersey joins in seeking review, but does not ask for relief, does not take a position on what relief would be well, why, why wouldn't uh, — imagine — look, there — in Article 2, it says that the President shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. So the President has worked out, I personally, and for reasons in in my department, others think that this law is unconstitutional, but I have this obligation. And because I have this obligation, I will not. I will continue to execute this law. I will continue to execute it, though I disagree with it. And I execute it until I have an authoritative determination not to. How is that different from a trustee? who believes that he has an obligation to a trust to do something under a certain provision that he thinks doesn't require that. But, you know, there's a debate about it. But he says, I have the obligation here. I'm going to follow this through. There'd be standing in the second case for any fiduciary, despite his personal beliefs, 
to continue. We'd understand that and say there was standing. Why don't we hear? Well, the trustee, I think, would be able to go to a court of first instance to get an adjudication of the claim. What I'm submitting to you that the trustee could not do, after getting the first the, the judgment in the court of first instance stating what the remedy, what the liability is, then seek review of that judgment, but ask only for it to be a. That's the part I don't understand. If, we're, if in fact, as you agree, the trustee or other fiduciary, in my example would indeed have standing to act according to the law, even though he thinks that that law is unconstitutional because of his obligation, such as under Section 2. You agree he has the — he has the it here. There is standing when he goes into court in the first place. Well, surely he could interpret Article 2 as saying, and you follow it through, as long as you can do it, which includes appeals until the matter is determined finally and authoritatively by a court. If you could do the first, what suddenly stops you from doing the second? In the first instance, the obligations are uncertain. The trustee is presumably subject to potentially adverse competing claims on his or her action. Well, I would have thought thought your answer would be that the executive's obligation to execute the law includes the obligation to execute the law consistent with the Constitution. And if he has made a determination that executing the law by enforcing the terms is unconstitutional, I don't see why he doesn't have the courage of his convictions and execute not only the statute, but do it consistent with his view of the Constitution. Rather than saying, oh, we'll wait till the Supreme Court tells us we have no choice. Mr. Chief Justice, I think that's a hard question under Article 2. But I think the Article 3 questions that this Court is facing turn on what the parties in the case have alleged, what relief they're seeking, and what the posture is. In in Federal Court's jurisprudence, are you saying there's a lack of adversity here? I am saying primarily — Can you give us a pigeonhole? It's a little difficult because the circumstance is unusual, uh, Justice Kennedy, but I think the most apt of the doctrines, although they are overlapping and reinforce each other, the most apt is standing. This Court has made clear that a party on appeal has to meet the same Article III standing requirements of injury caused by the action complained of and redressable by the relief requested by the — Well, it seems to me there's there's injury here. Well, uh, Your Honor, I do not agree that the injuries alleged by the United States should be cognizable by the Article III courts because those injuries are exactly what it asked the courts below to, uh, to produce. But even if we treat the injuries as sufficiently alleged, Article III requires that the party complaining of injury ask the court to remedy that injury. And that's a very important requirement, I think, under Article III for several reasons. The idea of the case or controversy limitation, as I understand it, is part of a broader separation of powers picture to make sure the federal courts perform their proper role. Their proper role is the redress of injury, and it is the need to redress injury in ordinary litigation that justifies judicial review of constitutional issues. But, Ms. Jackson, I mean, to go back to Justice Kennedy's point, we have injury here in the most classic, most concrete sense. There's $300,000 that's going to come out of the government's Treasury if this decision is upheld, and it won't if it isn't. Now, the government is willing to pay that $300,000, would be happy to pay that $300,000, But whether the government is happy or sad to pay that $300,000, the government is still paying the $300,000, which in the usual set of circumstances is the classic Article III injury. Why isn't it here? Justice Kagan, there is a three-prong test. Even if you treat that as injury, it does not meet the requirements for standing on appeal because the government has not asked this Court to remedy that injury. The government has not asked this Court to overturn the rulings below so it doesn't have to pay the $365,000. It has asked this Court to affirm. 
And the case or controversy requirements that we're talking about are nested in an adversarial system where we rely on the parties to state their injuries and make their claims for relief. If the government or any party is not bound with respect to standing by its articulated request for a remedy, what that does is it enables the court to fill in, to reshape, and for a doctrine that is supposed to be limiting the occasions for judicial review of constitutionality, that is troubling. But don't we often separate those two things, ask whether there's injury for Article Three purposes and causation and redressability, as you say, but then say, well, sometimes when all of those are met, there's not going to be adequate presentation of the arguments. And so we will appoint an amicus or will restructure things. And we do that when the government confesses error often. I mean, we do that several times a year in this courtroom. Yes, Your Honor, but confession of error cases with respect are quite different because in confession of error cases, typically both parties at the appellate level end up being adverse to the judgment below. And they are asking relief from this court from the judgment below. But here we have a situation where, uh, putting Blag to one side for the moment, between the United States and Ms. Windsor, there is no adversity, they're in agreement, and neither of them is asking this court to reverse or modify the judgment below. And so I think the confession of error cases are quite different from the perspective of Article 3. No, they're not in agreement about whether to pay the money or not. They are in agreement about what arguments are, are correct legal arguments. And I can't think of a case other than the sham cases, which, which this isn't, uh, where, where you would find no standing or other obstacle. And I can think of one case, which you haven't mentioned, namely Chada, which seems about identical. Uh, Your Honor, uh, I don't think that Chada is identical with respect uh, in, for, for two main reasons. In Chada, the Court was, I think, quite careful to avoid deciding whether the United States had Article III standing. It intensively analyzed a statute since repealed, 1252, which gave this Court mandatory jurisdiction in cases in which a federal statute was held unconstitutional and the U.S. was a party. Uh, and it framed its analysis of whether the statute permitted the appeal. What I I think was go oh may I reserve my time you uh, can for rebuttal? Your sentence. Thank you. Uh, what was what was going on there was the court said, well the statute wanted to reach very broadly, perhaps implicit, not stated, perhaps more broadly than Article Three. Congress said whenever you have this configuration, you go up to the Supreme Court. Then the Supreme Court in Chada says, of course, in addition to the statute. There must be Article Three case or controversy. The presence of the congressional interveners here provides it. Thank and you, that Counsel. That, that was more than a sentence. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, play a recording. Remember, the Supreme Court cases aren't videotaped or video. That's an antiquated word. They're not um, recorded video by video. Um, so it's done audio, uh, an audio file. So I have the Windsor case, the first, um, I want you to listen to the first 15 minutes or so. Um, if you want to listen to the whole thing, it's two hours. Um, they'll have the oral arguments here. So just come to this YouTube page. It's run by the Supreme court. Um, and it just basically they're establishing jurisdiction in the Windsor case. And it's interesting to hear, the justices go back and forth with, in this case, it's the Solicitor General, and um, who is the attorney for the United States. And they go back and forth about whether or not there's jurisdiction or whether or not there's standing, meaning that the Supreme Court is whether or not, the, uh, whether or not seeing if they can address this grievance. All right. So take a listen. Um, here's the link if you want to listen to the whole thing. It's kind of fascinating to me, um, but I understand if you just want to listen to the first 16. So I'll cut out the first 16 and point it in, I mean, um, um, bit it into our lecture, and you should be able to listen to it. The U.S. Supreme Court. With state cases, it'll go from trial courts, then to the California Court of Appeals, then the California Supreme Court. Remember, they only deal with California law. 
right? And if the California Supreme Court decisions uh, need be, they can be directly appealed to the United States Supreme Court. Remember, they do not have to start over in federal court, but they do have to have all remedies exhausted before they can apply directly to the Supreme Court. Now, one thing about state courts, if you look at here, here are state court systems. Go ahead and click on the link. We'll have trial courts. We'll also have a, a, a district court of appeals here in California. And then we have the California Supreme Court. Uh, California Superior Court judges, you know, we're going to maybe have to deal with them. Uh, if you really want to be, uh, you know, know something and, and be honest is we're all going to have uh, an experience with um, the court system within our lifetime and I think at the very minimum we're all going to have to deal with traffic court at a time traffic court is a part of the California Superior Court system the judges that hear cases whether it be in in in, in criminal cases or civil cases or small claims cases they're all going to be heard by state judges and these state judges are it are individuals that have to run for re-election or try to take the office of another judge through an election. So what will happen is if a, if a judge um, position is open, the governor can appoint a judge to that to fill that, and then that judge has to run for re-election. If there is a judge that has to run for re-election, they can also be ran against. So another attorney can come in and run against them. We have the justices of the California Supreme Court and California Appeals Court are first appointed by the governor. However, at the very next general election style, they must be confirmed by the voters. So it could be a political position, right? Usually they serve 12-year terms before uh, coming up for election. And justices that appear on the ballot uncontested, which means no voters only have two options. They have to have at least one vote. And if you're pretty smart, you'll vote for yourself, right? Talked about the trial court. We have criminal courts, which you can have a jury or a judge. The standard to convict somebody under a trial court is beyond a reasonable doubt, meaning that there can't be one percent doubt in, uh, you know, the 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 judgment that somebody is not guilty. So if there is a one percent doubt, then you have a instance where that person is to be found not guilty. Civil cases can be through a judge or a jury. They rely on something called preponderance of the evidence, you know, something that's more likely than not. Um, especially in civil cases, you can uh, maybe assign blame percentage-wise. So say, for instance, I sue McDonald's and I win a million dollars, but the jury or the judge finds that I'm at least 10% at fault to my grievance. Um, I'll only get 90% of the award. And you don't have to have that a unanimous jury like it is in criminal court you can have a it really depends on the size of the jury but i think at most instances uh you know it's more than 50 percent you know preponderance of the evidence we have small claims courts these are you know kind of your judge duty type courts where we have disputes that are less than ten thousand heard uh you don't need a lawyer the person who files a, cl a claim is called a p plaintiff and they go against the defendant then we have our Court of Appeals you, you can look at. And then we have our California Supreme Court, which has seven justices as opposed to the United States Supreme Court nine. Um, they have about 7,900 cases a year with about 85 cases hurt. And if you look at this, you're going to see, and you click on this link, you're going to see that generally these uh, justices are going to be very diverse. Okay, so that's our court system. Thank you, and we'll see you soon. We've seen the structure of the federal court system, so now let's talk about the state court system. Uh, and state court systems are structured very similarly, uh, but, but there are some differences, so, so let's see what they are. And, and as an example, I'll use the California state court system. Um, just, but just keep in mind that, that every state's court system is a little different. So if you want to know how a particular state's court system is structured, you may have to do some research uh, to see how the court system for that state might be similar or different. Now, like the federal court system, every state court system has a high court. A high court. 
And, and that court operates a lot like the United States Supreme Court does. Uh, it grants certiorari to review the decisions of lower courts. Now, it isn't always called the Supreme Court in every state, but in California, the high court does happen to be called the Supreme Court, the, the, the California Supreme Court. So that's what this box is, the California Supreme Court. And just like the federal court system, directly below the high court is an intermediate layer. An intermediate layer. Um, and in the federal court system, remember, we call to the courts in this intermediate appellate layer the circuit courts, right? The circuit courts. But in the California court system, the state court system, we just call this intermediate layer the court of appeal. The court of appeal. All right. Now, there are a few things to note about the Court of Appeal. First, remember that the circuit courts in the federal court system, uh, that they're officially called the United States Court of Appeals for the name of the circuit. Right. So, for example, the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. But in the California state court system, we don't call the intermediate appellate court the Court of Appeals. We call it the Court of Appeal with no S. Right? That's just something you want to keep in mind if you ever happen to be in the California Court of Appeal. If you're there and you say you're in the Court of Appeals, um, people are likely to think, aha, this is, this is amateur hour. <laughs> this person must not be from around here because he doesn't know that around here we call it the, the Court of Appeal, not the Court of Appeals. All right. So th um, th the second thing to note about the California Court of Appeal is that it uses some familiar terms, but it uses them differently. Uh, in the California state court system, the intermediate appellate layer is divided into what we call districts. The California Court of Appeal has districts. Uh, there are six districts in the California Court of Appeal. The first district, second, third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth. Right? Remember that in the federal court system, the appellate courts are divided into circuits. Right? Let's look back at our federal court map. Right? The intermediate appellate layer was divided into circuits, and each circuit um, had its own had its own court, and the circuit courts hear the appeals from the trial courts, which are called district courts. But in the California state court system, the appellate court is divided into districts. There are no circuits. They're divided into districts. And in each district of the California Court of Appeal, here's appeals from the trial courts of that district. So the term district is used differently by the federal court system and the California state court system. So be sure that you use the term correctly. So each district of the California Court of Appeal uh, is responsible for hearing the appeals from the trial courts in that district. Right, so we've got the different trial courts within each district. Um, and the trial courts in the California state court system are, are, are called something different. Obviously, they can't be called district courts. So in the California state court system, the trial courts are called the superior courts. The superior courts. Right, there's a separate superior court for each county. Each county has its own superior court. So if we look at a map of the state, let's come down here and take a look at a map of the state, we can see that uh, the state is divided into six districts, and they're, they're color-coded here on this map. Right? There's a, a different color for each of the districts. And, and each of the districts is divided into counties. That's what these little divisions are, and they're all labeled. Right? Now, each of these counties has its own superior court. And as I said, the superior court is the trial court of the California state court system. Right? So in the first district, we had counties that are colored blue, like uh, San Francisco, Marin, and Napa. In the second district, which is green on this map, let's see, we've got um, LA, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo. And then um, in the fifth district, the orange district, We've got counties like Fresno, Kings, and Kern counties. All right, so now let's go back up to our diagram and fill this in. So in the first district, we had 
the San Francisco Superior Court. We had the Marin Superior Court and Napa. And there, and there were several others. These are just a few examples. And remember, in the second district, we had L.A. County, so the L.A. Superior Court, Los Angeles County Superior Court. Uh, what else did we have? We had Santa Barbara. And we had uh, San Luis Obispo. I think there was one other one, Ventura County Superior Court. Um, and then in the fifth district, we had... Um, Fresno, Fresno Superior Court, and we had Kings County Superior Court, and Kern, and there, and there were several others. There were several others. All right, so that's the way the structure works. We've got a separate, a separate Superior Court for each county, and there are several counties within each district of the Court of Appeal. All right, so... The next thing to note about the California Court of Appeal is that it's technically one court. It's just one court. Right? So in the federal court system, let's go back and look at our federal court diagram. In the federal court system, there was a separate circuit court, or I should say there is a separate circuit court for each circuit. Each circuit has its own court of appeals. So the second circuit has its own court, and the ninth circuit has its own court. And, and these courts are separate jurisdictions, so they don't necessarily follow each other's decisions. But the California, the California Court of Appeal, the State Court of Appeal, California State of Appeal Court of Appeal is just one big court. It's just one court. Now, that's why I've drawn this box here as one big, continuous, and uh, connected whole, right? The districts of the California Court of Appeal are just parts of one unified court. Okay, so what, what does that mean? Well, in the federal court system, each circuit, each circuit has its own court, and each court is a separate court, right? Each circuit court is its own separate court. Uh, and the trial courts inside of each circuit are bound by the decisions of that circuit court. But but the trial courts are not bound by the decisions of other circuit courts, right? Because they're not in that circuit. Okay, In the California state court system, we only have one court of appeal. Sure, it's divided into districts, right? But technically, it's one unified court. So that means while appeals from San Francisco... Appeals from the San Francisco Superior Court may go to the first district of the California Court of Appeal, and appeals from Los Angeles may go to the second district of the California Court of Appeal. All of the superior courts are bound by all of the decisions of the California Court of Appeal. Right? If the fifth district Court of Appeal makes a ruling on a particular issue, the San Francisco Superior Court is technically bound by that ruling, even though it's in the first district. Okay, this is an important difference from the federal court system. 